those of you who don't know me, my name is Rebecca Colwell. I am the program manager here at Acadia for uh, resources. So I applied for an ICAP, which is an International Technical Assistance Program uh, gig, and was accepted for this one, which is uh, USAID uh, engaged with, I hate this so many times, with um, the ITAP program to do a, an assessment of community-based natural resource management programs and environmental safeguards related to indigenous people in three countries in South Africa, in Southern Africa, South Africa, Namibia, and Botswana. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about where I went and what we did, if anybody cares. So CBMRN is a is sort of the, the it has been a uh, an approach and a methodology around working with the developing world for a really long time, probably about thirty years. It's pretty much gone by the boards now. It's not really widely used anymore as an approach to engaging with Indigenous people because it's almost always based on. Here are the natural resources. These are the things we care about. And oh, gee, I guess there's some people there too, but we don't care about them. We're only, you know, the focus has always been on natural resource management. And the idea is that if you include communities, include community people in natural resource management, you get a result around uh, enge engagement, but it hasn't worked very well. And so, um, um, so USAID is rethinking that approach as a, a lot of international uh, organizations and other nations that are working in the in the developing world everywhere. <clears throat> so how uh, do I make my screen advance? How come I can't advance my screen? Maybe I can now. Maybe I can now. Maybe I can now. Get that yeah. What? The arrow, I mean. <laughs> no. How come it won't let me advance my screen? Anybody have any brilliant ideas besides hit the arrow? Anyone? Make sure, that, make sure that your mouse is on the screen where the projected re view is. Or the well, I'm using the an enter button on my laptop. I'm using my mouse. None, of, neither one of them are working to advance this the my program. You might need to go out of the um go okay. out and back in. All right. Thank you, Kate. All right, I actually was able to do it just by pounding on my mouse. So bear with me here. See, then there's this stupid thing. If I can get rid of this, hide the video panel. Sorry, folks. Um, anyway, ITAP, as I said, is the uh, part of the US Department of the Interior and it's a program. There we go that draws on expertise within within all of the DOI agencies and bureaus. And if you go to fundamentals, they're going to ask you, what are all the bureaus in the Department of the Interior? And did you know there are a lot of them? And uh, MPS is only one of them. But here's the, kind of the full range of uh, agencies and bureaus that ITAP draws on. So what happens is, is a, an, uh, uh, in this case, USAID, but it doesn't necessarily them. It's also other other uh, international organizations or even countries will come to uh, DOI and say, "Hey, we're interested in this kind of thing. We're looking for this kind of expertise." And ITAP sets up a a plan and a project and a process to to in, um, recruit and then um, identify a scope of work. And at, at, as we speak, literally at this moment. Abe's in uh, the Philippines on a, a ITAP that is for ASEAN, the uh, uh, Asian Association of Southeast Asian Nations. So he's going to the Philippines and Indonesia. This was something that came up in a 
a State Department level uh, meetings with with ASEAN nations around climate change response and adaptation. So um, that's kind of an example of the kind of things that that we do with other um, either countries or other organizations. Was selected to go, and we flew into. I'm going to show you quickly where we were. We started in Pretoria. We went to the just um, met with this a, a USA and the State Department in Pretoria in South Africa. Then we flew up to Windhoek in Namibia, uh, which is the capital of Namibia. We met with some of NGOs there, and then we spent most of our time up in this country that this area that's now called the. Uh, Kavango region, in, mostly in Namibia, um, along what used to be known as the Caprivi Strip, but it's now called the Kavango region, which borders on, mostly on Botswana and, and Angola and uh, Z Zambia and Zimbabwe, and so this region. And then we flew back to Pretoria and then a 15 hour trip flight back here to the States. Um, to give, we were focusing on a region called the Babwata National Park. That was the the uh, mm -hmm. area where U.S. aid is now uh, engaging with a lot of indigenous people and and putting in funding around uh, supporting NGOs who are doing such. Babwata is a, a fairly new national park in mostly Namibia and with but with quite a considerable overlap with Botswana as well. Mm -hmm. This. Thing here that looks like this these tree roots. That's the Okavanga Delta. So this is one of the the largest um, deltas, water systems in the world. And you can this is literally you can see it from from space. Uh, it's huge. And and if anybody has, and there was an incredible National Geographic film which is like into the Okavango where they like took their, tried to take their little more coros and go up into the river drainages here. Um, enormous, hugely, uh, it floods and, it, and vast areas in parts of the year and the rest of the year is really dry. So as I said, we spent most of our time uh, at uh, the National Park at Babwata. I just thought you might like to see what the visitor center looks like in, in Namibia. <clears throat> the park is this, like I said, this long, this, Namibia is this really funny country, it's a big square, and then it has this weird little arm that sticks out. It runs all the way to the um, to the border with, with uh, um, both the uh, Okay, um, Zimbabwe up here and South Africa down here and, and Botswana. But it's this little area you can see where this is where the Babwata National Park is. As I said, it's been a protected area in, since the 90s, but it hasn't been a, a, a Namibian, official Namibian National Park until the, about 2005, 2006. It's a long strip of this main road that runs from Devindu all the way over. If you keep going this way uh, past Kigali, Congo area, you're going to come and run into um, uh, Livingston and, and you know, the Victoria Falls region. We, we were a an hour away from Victoria Falls and didn't make it there. We just didn't have the time to get there. So the park is really interesting. The way these parks are uh, managed and kind of pieced out is really fascinating for someone who comes to, from a place where we draw a big right line around a place and we create a national park. And it's like, we have one kind of mission, which is to protect the resources and also for, for visitor experience and visitor use. These parks are oftentimes cobbled together from a variety of different flavors of, of land management. So within a national park like this, you'll have areas where people live, you have places, where, parts of it where people ranch cattle, uh, there are places where there's a lot of tourism. There are places where other kinds of um, uses are allowed or are not allowed. And so within this, the, within the Kavango, this Okavango region, you can see there are private farms. There are what they call gazetted farm areas. So um, when Namibia came into being in a lot of these Southern African countries, 
there, uh, there, uh, there was a lot of land re uh, uh, assessment reassignment. So white farmers' lands were taken away, and then held within the uh, the ownership of the country. Most of Namibia is actually owned and managed by the government, and not people don't generally own a lot of land. It's very unusual, but there are a lot of these big. Uh, vestiges of colonial farms and other kinds of big management areas as well. So a lot of different kind of flavors of how land gets managed. Most of it is managed uh, at the national level and has very little input from local people. And this is the dream team. <laughs> so this is us. Um, you know, this is the, the, the this is at the entrance to the park. These little boats. This is the little. These are called makoros. They're still being used. Everybody uses them. It's literally just a log that's that's dug out, and people uh, use these in the in the rivers and all the, the drainages. But um, from left to right, uh, the, the who who went on this trip? That DJ is he's a uh, tribal liaison with the uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. He's um, He's a uh, Mohawk and has worked for fish for a really long time on tribal affairs issues. And then there's me. And Maria uh, uh, Wiseman is an attorney for the BIA. She's doing a lot of work. She spend, spends two things that she's been doing lately. One is traveling with the secretary on some of her truth and reconciliation listening sessions going into uh, Indian country around residential schools. So that's like really traumatic work that she does. And the other is working on a lot of uh, agreements and planning work with uh, tribal uh, uh, nations around for things like, for example, creating new agreements around the uh, land assignments and uh, how communities are moving away from the coast in Alaska. So uh, literally having to get up and move entire communities because of sea level rise and and uh, erosion and loss of all, all of their communities. So she she's one of the people that's building out a lot of the, the legal structure for that kind of approach within the Bureau of Indian Affairs. Uh, Kara Steger is the ITAP coordinate, program coordinator. So she, she was the person who pulled us all together and got the work. And then Brad Granham is also, an, uh, he's a solicitor with uh, main interior. He lives in uh, Oregon. He does a lot of work on um, uh, uh, water rights issues at the level of the Department of the Interior. So a lot of the really big dam removals and uh, policy stuff related to that is is kind of things that he does. So we were, you know, like I said, a, a dream team. And then there was just me who just like works in a park. But uh, anyway. <laughs> And then the rest of the crew that we traveled with as well. So we we traveled with a couple from uh, the USA, Gina and Capello, who are like they're in country. They're the coordinators for USA for this project. And then this bunch also, because we all had to get in one of these little boats and try them out, are a couple of folks from a couple of the uh, NGOs that are working. They're kind of the middlemen between US aid and some of the communities are a couple of these uh, NGOs that are doing a lot of co consulting as well. One is um, natural justice and they have three attorneys from natural justice. They do a lot of uh, really big, really profound legal rights for indigenous people in Southern Africa. One of the most, uh, the, one of their recent really big wins was to literally throw out a, a situation where Shell was going to develop offshore energy in South Africa and natural justice took them to the uh, the um, Supreme Court in South Africa and showed that even within the context of the, of the regulations and law, they're kind of NEPA. South Africa and Shell did not follow NEPA. They did not consult with indigenous people, particularly around the massive impacts of this offshore energy development for fishing communities. And so that 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 the whole development's on hold, uh, pending more a review. But it was uh, it was Jackie, this amazing attorney here in the middle, who was the one who argued that case and at the Supreme Court in South Africa. 
And then a, a couple of other folks who are from IPAC, which is the Indigenous Peoples of Africa Coordinating Committee. They are mostly San people, and I'll talk a little bit about the, the uh, ethnic identity of you know, Khoisan versus a kind of the Bantu uh, speaking folks of Southern Africa. Um, and they do a lot of work with Indigenous people's rights throughout uh, throughout uh, Africa. So those were the kind of our, our travel mates, was really cool. Um, we spent a lot of time trying to figure out what the hell we were going to do when we got on the ground. It was, you know, we, we had an itinerary. We had communities that we were going to visit with. We had this and that. And then everything got blew up as soon as we landed because the government of Namibia said, ah, we don't want you talking to any of those people that live in that park. <laughs> and it's like, whoa. Um, there was, we, we ran into a little bit of a, 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 a situation between the, uh, the government of Namibia and the State Department of the United States uh, disagreeing around the authority for USA to actually be working with indigenous people in these protected areas. So we ended up kind of moving around some of the work we were going to do as a result of that. But it was all great. You've got to be flexible. So as I said, uh, we're primarily working in this region with people who are ethnically uh, known as either Quay or if you ever took any anthropology course from about 1965 to now, you would learn about the uh, the Kungsan people or the or the, the people of the Kalahari, the original hunter gatherers, the people who are like you know they the 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 ancient ones. And those people still exist. They've been mostly removed from their most of their control of the ho their homelands and put into really marginalized areas. But um, and they still speak San, although they that's not an officially recognized language. Uh, indigenous people are not generally with in any of these countries. There's no such thing as indigenous people. You're all uh, Botswana. Or if you're, uh, you know, from South Africa, there's a whole you know, legacy of history there. So that there's generally not this recognition of anything of, you know, of sovereign indigenous people. So when we went in and we talked about, well, we work with the tribes on this and we work with the tribes on that. It's like people looked at us like tribes means something completely different. So the tribalism is a thing, but it's not an identity that has any kind of legal status in any of these three countries. So we kind of had to work around our understanding of who we were working with and how, what the authority is for engaging with indigenous people. For example, here, of course, federally recognized tribes. We, we, rec you know, we have a government to government relationship. We do formal consultation. We include that in all of our decision-making, but these people are just like squatters living in a national park. You know, they're not, who are these people and what's the reason to even go and talk to them? So um, so that was kind of the context here. We spent time, as I said, particularly in this Quay re region here around Nagaranga, I cannot pronounce any of these, and then over here in Chobe a National Park as well. And for example, this is the Kiramasan Association. This is, like, I, as I said, there's the flavor of who these people are is very different and uh, but in terms of having consultations with uh, a, a, these organizations, because they the NGOs represent the people on the ground, but the people on the ground aren't recognized by anybody else. So there's this challenge with how USAID uh, understands who to work with and how they funnel funding to some of these really small community associations. And this was this was one of the groups that we had a privilege to spend a day with and have listened to them talk about their uh, sorry talk about their experience. And as I said, these people are living in, within the boundary of the national park within Babwata. They don't own any land. They don't have any rights to own land. They're not allowed to hunt. They're not allowed to gather in the park. And so the challenge is around how USAID works with folks in this area are, are enormous. Like, who do you give money to to do capacity building or to do anything? And so there's a lot of work around trying to understand some of those challenges. 
There's a lot of interest in protecting the language, protecting the culture, um, building building uh, some uh, opportunities for for capacity, really, because you know you, you people just have they have they have very little capacity to uh, do much of anything, and so some of the NGOs that we were working with are working on the ground in that context. <clears throat> This is kind of how, uh, typical of where, how people live. This is actually pretty, uh, this is one of the uh, communities we were taking to, to sort of say, here's what we're doing. Here's all the wonderful things we're doing. So I felt like all of the kids and all of the dogs and all everything had been kind of cleaned up and moved <laughs> away. It was really kind of sterile, but it's kind of, you know, it, the pe people live in thatch roof little houses still. And a lot of, uh, uh, and they're a long way from anywhere. There's no water, um, very, you know, they have no electricity, of course. And so they spend a lot of time in just trying to uh, acquire basic needs like food and water and those kinds of things. But everybody has a cell phone. Everybody is on uh, uh, WhatsApp and everybody has an ATM card and that's how they live their lives. So it's, you know, they're not, we're not talking about, you know, people who've like never seen a television or don't know, you know, but but they are really in really remote um, challenged areas. Um, and these are some of the folks that we saw along with. This, this woman, she could have been, I don't know, 70 or she could have been 109 if I couldn't, you know, you couldn't tell. She of course didn't speak English, she only spoke Quay, San, but we were taking into this community and the young man who's talking about she, they're, 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 these are people who are always hunters and gatherers. So they, they were out on the land, they, you know, people who were tr famous trackers. And during the civil wars in the 90s, a lot of San were engaged in, as, as, as trackers because they can go into the Kalahari and literally and, and, and live. Um, and but they people have were forcibly not forcibly resettled into some of these little communities because you know somebody wanted to like keep track of them or um, or you know some attempt to possibly provide uh, services for them. But so we were taken to her her little village to and shown this little tiny garden that there, there's one of the uh, NGOs is is trying to. Uh, help these help people with building they call them little circle gardens I mean literally a garden the size of half of this table within the community because these people are not uh, they're not farmers that's not what they did but now they're you know being forced to do so and and also within a context of intense climate change as you can imagine I mean the, this area is there's, you know, it's in drought conditions and really severe and very, very marginal. So a lot of people eat a lot of sorghum and they eat a lot of millet. And while they're going, walking five miles or whatever to, to the river, to wherever they might be able to get some water, a couple of things they have to negotiate is when they get to the river is crocodiles and these critters. <laughs> uh, hippos kill a lot of people in uh in this this region so they're, they're usually you know we heard stories of people when you go to the river to get water there's always one or two people that are watching out for crocodiles or 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 uh hippos and somebody else that's getting water because it's so it's a it's a dangerous uh place to be they're pretty cool up close when you're in a big boat though and like I said, the other creatures you have to be careful are, are these guys, and they're everywhere. Huge, huge, huge crocodile. Terrifying. <laughs> and let's talk about elephants while we're there. So when we were we were traveling around, we saw a lot of elephants. And it was really, really cool to see an elephant. And to hear an elephant doing this, it was like. Um, this area, particularly along the, in the uh, Kavango, is one of the densest places for elephants in Southern Africa. So we've got this little strip of land, and, it, and further south as well, but it's a really a strip that that's borders the Okavango and the, some of the other, uh, the Chobi, some of the other rivers that, and so this is an area that concentrates animals, and uh, uh, 
uh, for many, many years, there, the elephants from Angola came over into Namibia and to Botswana because Angola was a war zone and animals were being killed as much as people were. Still, really a uh, very, very high number of uh, landmines and it's really, really dangerous. And the elephants moved across the river and elephants have no things, they really remember. And so in this area, there are more elephants than there are people. And the elephants are a, of course, a prize resource because all of us want to go and see elephants, right? Um, and people are not allowed to manage elephants in any way. And so the elephants kind of roam around and 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 they're really it's a it's a real problem you know when you're trying to settle people and have them be farmers in a place where there's drought and seasonally and then you have all of these giant animals who are also you know roaming around and doing their thing as well so one of the um ngos that we spend a lot of time with what is called eco exists and their community base founded uh, sometime in the uh, early 2000s. And what they're trying to do is uh, get people and elephants to live together because people, you know, they, you know, and, uh, and so um, the, the, to conserve elephants, we want to support people, but also to protect people, we want to figure out how they can learn to live with elephants. And so there was some, there's a lot of work around, you know, identifying these elephant corridors, for example, in a few of the communities where the, when the kids have to go to school, if they walk along the roads, they run into elephants and they die. And so in some places, they're, they, uh, eco exists is buying, you know, buses and vans so the kids can go to school safely. Or when the people are going to get water, uh, you know. And so they're also working on uh, trying to figure out how to garden in this area and build gardens that are um, sustainable for people. So they're learning, figuring out, looking at climate change and trying to grow things that are uh, less water intensive kinds of gardens, but also gardens that can be protected from elephants because if you left this open, um, it gets, you know, they come and they eat everything. And this gal here, Maya, she was incredible. She works for Eco Exist. She goes out and works with all of the farmers in this region. And a couple of things she does is she tries to help them get resources. So, you know, like you'll have like that little old lady I showed you the picture of earlier, that when, when her garden is is green and, and, and she will go out and sit out in the dark with pots and pans mm -hmm. in her garden when the elephants come through and try to scare them away. And oh, by the way, they're gonna be, you know, lions and other kinds of predators as well. But this is what people try to do to, to survive. And so what Ecosys is trying to do is a bunch of things that they're, they're, they're trying to give farmers resources. Um, they're, they're helping them build uh, fences around their gardens and consolidating gardens from individual plots into some really, really large gardens, putting fencing around them, putting up solar powered uh, tracking devices and lighting, putting putting tra tracking elephants. So when the elephants move through, because they move through along what used to be old roads and they move uh, you know, regularly, they try to at least warn people, the elephants are coming. And so they're doing a lot of work with, with, with just trying to, to protect gardens um, from from elephants, uh, and this this is the, the, the this bunch we had a chance to spend the day with them. They're also doing other kinds of things around really really fun, really small scale uh, kind of entrepreneurship, and this is this is Gina from USA. USA has been funding a lot of this. They're funding things like planning. Uh, kind of community capacity building, and then giving them some funding for some of these really small scale entrepreneurial things. So here they're making paper using, they're collecting elephant dung, making elephant dung paper to be able to sell for to the tourists like us who come through and want something. And they're also doing, they're, this is a, a distillery. They're trying to figure out this, and I I wish I could remember, Jesse, what this plant is. It's like jewel weed or something. It's a plant that grows, it's like an invasive that grows all the way around the, the, the all the edges of the gardens or any disturbed area. And it's 
um, they're ex think they're, it's got some they're thinking maybe that's what it is. I don't know what it is, but they're distilling it to see if there's like you can make soaps or can you make you know uh, cosmetics or is it because it has some uh, uh, medicinal value? And so they're experimenting with a bunch of different local plants. As I said, a lot of them which are invasives or plants that when they when they when they when the, when the elephants come through and chop down all the cut out, eat all the trees, and then these plants come in and then they just kind of choke out the area. So doing, you know, really, really tiny things with, with this kind of thing to, for, for the communities. And they're also doing this, which is they're working with the women. And this primarily the basket, the women are the basket makers to kind of expand their traditional basket making and uh, uh, as an entrepreneurial effort. And so they're, uh, is Kathy here? Kathy, would you mind going and getting your basket? I forgot to bring mine. So what they're doing is uh, EcoExist has a contract with um, the World Wildlife Fund. And if you give a certain amount of money to WWF, you'll get one of these little elephant baskets. And so they created a motif with, and the women weave baskets that have elephants in them. And they, we, we gave them a lot of money. <laughs> I bought a lot of baskets, and we all did, from from this uh, organization of, of women in this community. So, like really small scale things like this, but uh, uh, they know the value. This is their office. This is Eco Exists office in one of these communities. They just built it. Um, it's a little solar powered, like looks like one of our. Trailers, right? <laughs> you want to pass that around. This is an example of the kinds of baskets that they're making. Um, economy? Economy? They're mostly really subsistence farming, primarily subsistence. They're not even yeah. allowed to bear a farm. They're Barely. Gardening. Yeah. Yeah. They're gardening. You have, you have said a word about tourists coming through there. Tourists come through, but these people have almost, there's almost no, inter, in, there's no opportunities for these people, these communities to engage in. It's all owned and managed from afar. South African uh, internet companies own a lot of the, the lodges. Uh, the Germans still have a huge stake. And so there's a lot of tourism and you can spend a lot of money, and I'll show you what the lodge I stayed in while we were there, but there, these people have no access to that economy. A few of them, uh, uh, a few of the people work as maybe guides or trackers, people work at, in the service industry, like in, in the lodges, in the hotels, mm -hmm. a few people do, but they're a long way from where they're living is is removed in a long way from where the 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 eco resorts are, where where the animals are, in, and in, in and where the national parks are. General, yeah. With things like this, for example, this is the Quay Living History Museum. So this is one kind of small um, community based museum, and primarily what the Quay people here are really interested in is preserving their language and their traditions and their culture. Because as I said, a, 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 you know, language loss is one of the first things that always goes in when indigenous people get removed from the, and also knowledge. And so the knowledge of how to live in the Kalahari desert is like, there's the whole generations who don't know how to do this anymore. So they have tracking schools. Uh, IPAC is tracking schools and there's work around the language and work around just, you know, basically the, the, uh, the knowledge of what it means to be a San person. <clears throat> this is a uh, ostrich mm -hmm. egg that was used to make uh, to hold water, for example. And you know, so they're um, they're, they're kind of clinging to the to some of the the knowledge of the tra the ancestral traditions or people that are, have been living in this area for forty thousand years. This is one of our typical uh, uh, consultation meetings. Most of the time they were like uh, outside sitting around under a really big shady tree and, and trying to talk. This guy was doing a demonstration for us on how you crack mongongo nuts. And actually it, it looks kind of, the mongongo nuts kind of look like a Brazil nut. They're really, really hard shell. They are like the powerhouse food of the 
of, of and people have collected for thousands of years and uh, rely on for food. And he was like, this is the most crazy thing I've ever seen in my life. He has a upright ax between his legs. So the sharp edge up, he's got a stick in this hand. He's holding this nut on top of that ax and smashing it down to, to crack the damn thing open. <laughs> And people really do use these quotes to get around them. So they're not just a prop up for, for those of us who are you know, tourists. So they they use the macorals in uh, on the river, and they do a lot of fishing. I don't. Sorry. <laughs> sometimes it works, and sometimes it doesn't. Here we go. I'm going backwards. Sorry. Hmm. Ah. And some of us, like I said, who are just tourists who just get to sit in one of these boats and think, oh my God, I am not, I would never go out in this crocodile hippo infested river in this log. <laughs> but that people do all the time. And that's Angola over there. We were right on the border with Angola. So more meetings. This is kind of interesting. This is with um, the Kapinga Conservancy, and they've done. And as you can see, and this is a work that's been done with USAID support, which is to do some. Uh, what are, what are economic development opportunities for this conservancy uh, organization? And they kind of did a, a whole planning around various kinds of uh, things they could do for uh, for development with recognizing the capacity, recognizing climate change, recognizing, you know, all the lack of resources. And uh, we, what was really cool was when I got back, I started looking and one of the organizations we met with is on Facebook. And they talked about, hey, we had these people from the US Department of the Interior that came over and would want to learn about what we're doing here. Um, and this was Max from Kapinga, um, and he's been jailed by the uh, Namibian government. He's been, you know, all kinds of, for the kind of the work, that the human rights work that his organization is doing as well as in economic development. So they're trying to fisheries reserve, for example. Um, they're running up against, there's a lot of uh, mineral and oil and gas exploration happening across this area, vast areas that are just being destroyed by, uh, uh, you know, fossil fuel exploration, uh, fires, and his organization is one of them has been trying to stop this. And, and of course the whole poisoning of the river and the lack of fish anymore, I mean, it's just really. I, there is a lot of, there are, Forest opportunities and a beautiful little. This is the little lodge that I where I stay. This is my little cabin down on the river. And I woke up at three o'clock one morning with all this rough noise going on underneath me. And I quickly realized it was a bunch of hippos that had come out of the river because we were right on the river and was right underneath my little uh, my little uh, cabin in the woods. Uh, this is we were in an eco resort. There are lots of them there, as I said. I'm not, uh, there's no, there's not a lot, much economic opportunity for local people in some of these. You can find a few that, that are uh, wholly owned and managed by communities. If you want to go to Southern Africa, you should look for them. Uh, this, this wasn't one of them. It was owned by, a, as I said, a, a German company that owns a lot of eco lodges and eco lodges in Southern Africa. And then I'll just show you a few of the critters that we saw. <clears throat> It's Kate Buffalo. Obviously, you all know who the, what these are. Hippos, and this this is a eagle hawk. It looks just like a uh, uh, it looks just like a bald eagle. Acts like a bald eagle, except it sits on the back of hippos. <laughs> <laughs> and then this, there are so many birds. This is all along the Chobe River where we were. Uh, hippos, hippos. It was, it was late in the afternoon, and they'd all come out of the river. Uh, to um, 
grays, or browse, or whatever they do. But you can see they're very aggressive animals and they fight amongst themselves. And so this is this young male is just covered with scars from being from fighting or being attacked or whatever. Uh, baboons, lots of baboons along the river. This is, you can see hundreds of baboons. And what's really interesting is you can see the uh, gazelles, the little springbok in the back here. The, the baboons and the springbok travel together in groups. And uh, our guide uh, said the, the reason is, is the, um, the baboons will uh, alarm and let the uh, gazelles know that, that predators are coming. And the, the, predator, the predators get chased off by the, the gazelles and 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 the and so they travel together in these like groups of hundreds of them. Uh, that is a um, sable. They're very they're apparently they're quite rare now. They've been you know, hunted nearly to extinction. One of the, the really big beautiful uh, antelope in uh, this area. I'll show you a few more hippos because they're so. That's we got. This is how close we got to the you know, boat, and 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 you know, as I said, this, this region is very high density of elephant. So you see just herds of elephant all along driving along the side of the road from one one place to another, just wild. And along the Chobe River, there's a lot of of course uh, opportunities to go view the wildlife, and it's like. They really, the boats really do get this close to the animals. It's like, I don't think you should get that close to this elephant. Leave it alone. But of course, that's what we did too. As soon as that boat left, our little guy took us right in too. So we could be right next to the elephants. Um, really close to the elephant. And she has a, 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 a calf just around the corner here uh, that was kind of hiding out from us because we were really close, was uncomfortably close. And uh, the baboons let you know when you're too close. And this is a, 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 a water buck. They're another kind of uh, antelope that lives in this Chobe region. And just uh, all I could think of was like what it must have been like to be in the Pleistocene or be somewhere where you just the, the vast numbers of animals and birds in this wetland uh, along the river. It's just astonishing. Uh, that is a marabou stalk. And of course, you know what this guy is. And I was literally standing on a w walkway looking down at this uh, warthog underneath me. It's, you get really close to the animals. And apparently in uh, the, the town near Chobe, there are so many warthogs that they're really a problem. They come into people's backyards. They're kind of like, you know, deer that we have here. So you have war, war, warthogs coming into your backyard and eating your gardens. And they get into people's houses and cause damage. <laughs> <laughs> Zebras, of course. And then the largest crocodile I did see in the whole time we were there. And that's it. So the next step, I'm actually going to, I'm continuing to work with this organization, with this group. Um, there's a study tour of, um, folks that work in national parks in this region that are coming over here in April. We're gonna visit the Southwest, primarily gonna be around the Albuquerque area because they, uh, and and uh, so I'm gonna get a chance to to travel with uh, with some of these folks again. So, that's it. I don't know if anybody has any questions or comments or, Something in the chat? Nope. All right. You're welcome.